This is intended to show you the applications that you can obtain with a focus ion beam. And oh, one quick thing, Fred, but, um, if yes. everyone could, if you guys could go through the chat and just let us know what organization you're with and uh, how you heard about uh, the uh, this uh, webinar that would help us out as far as uh, getting the, the news out to other people. Right. Thanks. Um, and we have a number of other webinars from our group. So this way we'll be able to let you know if there is something else you're interested in. The FIB is a high, provides high resolution imaging. You can remove material at the micro to nano scale and deposit it at a similar scale. Because of that, you have a number of applications. Imaging, Ion channeling contrast gives us grain size analysis at the same time. SCM sample preparation, you can use that to obtain 3D reconstructions. TM sample preparation will spend a significant amount of time on that and fabrication. Imaging, there are many different types of contrasts, topography, Secondary electrons, that's probably what you'll be most used to with the instrument. Ion channeling, which I've already mentioned. <clears throat> Material contrast, voltage contrast, and secondary ion mass spectrometry. You can actually look at the positive and negative secondary ions and get information from them. This is something that we learned early on. Let's look at imaging. So if you have an optical image, <clears throat> Your light can look through an SiO2 layer, which is transparent to light, look at a silicon layer below where there may be features, and detect that. With a skin electron microscope, you have a somewhat limited penetration. With a focused ion beam, let's say 30 keV gallium, your penetration is actually quite small. So you may have a sample where you can look at the features which are below the surface and you put it into the FIV, you can't see them. Here's an example of topographic contrast. And it's very similar to what you have in SEM. You can tell in this semiconductor structure that you have features that are either innies or outies. You're getting some idea of the topography just from taking this image. Ion channeling contrast is a very, very useful feature with an FIV. Imagine you have your gallium beam striking the surface of two grains with different crystalline orientations. On the left, the gallium ion is striking the sample and the beam is aligned with the particular atoms. If you do, if you have that uh, situation, you'll see the secondary electrons that come off are from somewhat deeper in the material. Then if you have on the right, the gallium beam hitting on a misaligned crystal plane, here your secondary electrons are close to the surface. So we have deeper penetration and shallower penetration. As a result, the one on the right, the electrons close to the surface will appear brighter than the one on the left. In addition, you can see that the collisions that you'll have near the surface would make you think this would sputter at a higher rate, and it does. So the one on the right, misaligned, will be brighter and sputter faster. And if you look at materials that you may analyze, polycrystalline materials, such as metals, have many different grains with many different orientations. And because of this, we can get an idea of the grain size just from looking at the FIB ions in secondary electrons out image. Here's an example. Here's an aluminum layer. And if you look at a particular grain right here, now let's follow it through tilting the sample at different angles. You see now it's brighter and then a little bit darker and then back to dark again. And you can <clears throat> take these images as a set and pretty much deconvolute what all your grains are. 
Here's another example. And through this, uh, I have a number of references. Fibix is a company which has a lot of really uh, well done figures on their website and it's a place you may look. This is an aluminum can, let's call it a uh, beverage you would like to have. And you can see that the grains are not circular, they're stressed, they're stretched out because they're extruded because that's what's happened when you're making the uh, container. From a semiconductor standpoint, here's a structure where you have tungsten plugs and then an aluminum line attached to it. With the FIB secondary electron image, you can see immediately the tungsten grains are smaller. And when you look at the aluminum grains, you get information, certainly they're larger. You also see that in general, they cover the entire thickness of this particular layer. So a lot of information from just that secondary electron image. And I'll make a plug for our book here in 2005, where we're showing this is a TM preparation for a lift out, but stopping at this point, these are protective layers. You can see the grains just brilliantly displayed for copper. I've got several little videos, so I'm going to show one. This is a channeling contrast, and uh, in this particular material, we're going to go through this as a function of time sputtering. And as you look, you can see the various grains appear and then disappear. You can look at the edges of these. You can tell whether these defects, these black dots, are showing up at grain boundaries or not. You can see twinning. You can see all kinds of different features just by sputtering through this material and then looking, I'm going to play that one more time. Just by sputtering through this material and look at a particular grain, we'll see it arrive here. We're sputtering through it and now it's totally gone. If you have a detector where you can look at secondary ions, and that mainly means just biasing the detector negative, most of the ions are biased. Uh, most of the ions that come off are positive. Secondary electron, you've got a bias positive to detect the electrons. And if you look at this image, you might understand why you would consider doing that. Here's a cross section of a semiconductor feature. If you look at this one, you'll see there's a lot of black area here, and that typically means charging. When you look at the secondary ion image, in this particular case, you can see delineated a number of layers that you can't pick up in the electron image. The combination of the two can be very useful. You also see some of the other features involved with this particular transistor arrangement here. Now we're going to move on to secondary electron microscopy sample preparation. This was one of the first uses that semiconductor industry made of this technique. And the advantage to them was they could very quickly go to a site specific area, cross section it, and see what was going on with their process at that point. Look at cross sections. I won't mention much about an edge cut, but that's a way of getting a lot of information quickly at the edge of a sample, semiconductor applications, and some others. Initially, this process was done this way. You would select the area of interest, use high current to remove a lot of material, and then polish the surface directly with the ion beam. This enabled you to get an inform information from this area but it damaged the region significantly. Before too long, people came up with other approaches to this, and they did not want to have the ion beam damage the region of interest here. And what was made was a stair step. And since you wanted to look at this with an electron beam, you didn't really have to remove all this material. So we could set this up to remove just half the amount of material. So the ion beam is focused here at the surface, the electron beam would then come in. At this point, you didn't have the dual beams, you would take this to an SEM for analysis. 
And the stair step cut could be programmed into the computer so that it would sputter each area as you're going one through five here to remove more and more material with your region of interest being located right here. This gives you an idea of what something like that would provide. This frosty stuff you're seeing down here is redeposition, which we discussed quite a bit in the first uh, presentation, but that occurs because you're hitting with the ions coming down here and some of that material is deposited here. This is a protective platinum layer, and we're looking in this case at a porous alumina on metal. It's very fragile, and if you tried to analyze this with normal polishing, you would destroy it. From this, you can get some information very quickly. Number one, we can tell how thick this is, and we see that it's porous. We also see that the porosity is fairly similar from top to bottom. If you look at metal layers, and this is a coating from, that is used on the types of things you would find in your bathroom. That is now a high-tech industry. When people have, that, have problems in an industry, we actually do FIB analyses for them. There are different layers here. Sorry, I can't tell you what all of them are but you can see that the grain size varies. We have higher, larger grains here, smaller grains here. And if there's any discontinuity, we can look at it. For example, there's something like a crack going on over here. And we look at it in enough detail that they can mo modify their process to take care of it. If you're doing mechanical polishing, and in this case, there's a comparison here between mechanical and FIB polishing. Here's our protective layer. We're looking at an area here and we're not going to damage this with the way you would with the mechanical polish. But there is something to bear in mind. Here, that's a 30 by 30 micrometer region. Here, this is 30 millimeters by 100 mil micrometers. And if you look at this previous one, this is actually put together from several different cuts. Doesn't have to be just semiconductor materials. You can look at organic materials as well. And this is some of the work shown in Bennett Brent Apprenticer's PhD dissertation. Here's an SEM of a single hair, but here's an SEM showing an FIB cut through it and looking at various cuticle layers. And Ben Rossi, who also worked at our group in Bell Labs, when he then went to the uh, University of South Florida, came up with some imaginative ideas. One of them here is I've got something I want to look at, but it is covered. This is a plankton. By using the FIB to make the cut, using the probe to move it away, I can now look at the inside of this and then I can make further cuts for SEM analysis. And at NC State, there is a program studying dinosaurs. They're actually looking at dinosaur blood vessels and they'll be able to tell you if they had uh, eaten too many hamburgers this week. So they're looking at the types of material in the actual blood vessels. This is an example of that. If you're looking at fibers and NC State has a very large college of textiles. This is an example of this particular polymer fiber and they often do something called islands in the sea where they'll have a sea of material with material remote, uh, with strands inside of it. This is an example. And here's an, here, this is making two SCM cuts. There's a cut this way and this way so that you have a pseudo three-dimensional picture from this. Now going back to a semiconductor example, this will lead us into why you have a dual beam instrument. One of the many reasons why you would have a dual beam instrument. And this particular one has a feature which has been cut into. And you would say, that's great. I know where the problem is. It's right here. And if I go back in the process to this layer, I'll know what happened. If you cut further into this, as in slide two here, 
uh, in MH3 and MH4, now you see that this particular problem is occurring at a much earlier level. I'm going to play this video, which was actually taken in a, at a instrument vendor site and helped us to buy the first dobling we had in our organization. You'll see we're sputtering through a particular defect here. These are aluminum lines. And as we're sputtering through the defect, you also see little voids show up within these aluminum lines. There are some of them now. Those are due to electro migration. Playing this once again, take again a look. You've got an awful lot of details. So what we're doing, this was on an FEI instrument at that time called their slice and view. So we're slicing with the FIB and then taking a look at this. Now, if I put those together and put it in a 3D reconstruction, I have an image of what's going on with that entire defect and I've got a better idea of the size of it and what else is going on with it. Here's an example of a tin ball monitored with an FIV and this one's kind of neat because you can actually see it, it's like melting it away. But you're taking a cross section here um, this is 40 micrometers, so this is about 10 micrometers, something well within the ability of the FIV to do. And you're left with a very nice cross section here, and looks to me like everything's pretty uniform within that tin ball. And I'll play this one several times. What does wood look like when you sputter it? You'll see wood is very porous. Oops. Wood is very porous. And uh, you can see those openings with the FIB. Now we're going to move on to transmission electron microscopy, TEM preparation. And I'm going to mention three methods. This is what we initially used. And I'll mention the two processes in major use today. An example of the first one is shown here. We're actually mechanically polishing the sample. The other processes are going to involve lifting the sample out. In the mechanical polish plus FIB, what was done was to take a sample, polish it, attach it to the TM grid. They're all three millimeters worldwide, all the same. And by cutting away with the FIB, I can make this electron transparent. And now look at this with the image with the uh, TEM. So again, here's this example. We're going to remove the material with the ions. There's a protective layer on top here. We thin it to a certain transparency and to electron transparency and then image here. There are several issues with this. One of them is you have to destroy your sample. You're only leaving this maybe, you know, 30, 40 micrometer piece here. You also have this narrow channel. Therefore, if you're analyzing this in a TEM, you don't have a lot of angular freedom in order to do your analysis. This is one that was 70 micrometers thick. I think it's about the thickest we ever did. And this examples and shows, gives you an idea of one of our earliest publications on this. This is 1995, just for the heck of it. <laughs> so it's a couple of years ago, but you could see an awful lot from this and you would see different voids, for example, in this particular structure, which were very hard to obtain because just by polishing, you had to hit this exactly at the right location. This was done on a much older instrument. Now I'm gonna show a slide which shows the next process. And this is the lift out process. What you're seeing in almost real time is a glass rod that is drawn out to a small point. And in here we have cut an FIB section out. And now we have touched it with this glass rod and picked it up. We are moving this over to a 
TM grid, and this one is not open. It's got some form bar carbon on it. And now it's being placed onto that grid. So we have Van der Waals forces at work here. And the grid is actually a little bit sticky and allows us to put it on there. It's not quite right. We're going to move the probe in one more time. And now we have this image of this TEM section. This took very little time to do. And now hopefully you remember which where location you put this. This was used in many applications. Here's an example of a piece of artwork. And uh, I've actually seen and held this piece of artwork at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Andrew Lenz collaborated with Lucille Junitzi and I on uh, getting this. What's interesting is these are with an SEM EDS, you can determine what these are, and these are lead particles. And the question here was, was the painting being purposely darkened or was it a case of treatment or cleaning of the painting? And it appears that a lot of the cleaning processes used were affecting the surface of it. Also interesting, it might be pretty hard to forge a painting on this scale. You don't have to have a nice flat sample. If you can get something into your FIB, you should be able to analyze it. And here's a piece of coal worked aluminum. Here's the feature present here, where we have actually made the cut. And here's the analysis. You've got x-ray information and you can see the grains of this particular aluminum. Now this process has been refined further and before when we put this on a grid we couldn't thin it anymore and now the grids that have been developed by Lucille's company you can see that you can place this grid across an opening and now this allows us to thin it further and there are advantages and disadvantages to this method and the one I'll show you in the future but both of them are quite applicable let's go to the third process here and this particular one is lift out in vacuum. And in vacuum, what we're going to do is bring in a manipulator, but in this case, we're going to move it within the vacuum system to the TEM grid. In this case, we have deposited the material, we've cut out on either side, deposited a protective layer, cut out material from either side. And now you can see we've tilted this and we're cutting away almost totally. We bring in a needle and attach it with a deposition, cut it away completely, move the grid in place and attach it to it. There are different approaches to doing this. In this particular one, we attach it directly to the top of the grid as shown. And then we thinned part of this. Why do we only thin part of it? Well, there are a couple reasons for that. One is you've done a lot of work it's very easy to go too far here and have something cause you to lose the area of interest. Maybe you sped it a little too long. By doing it this way, you've got two tries at it if you need to. It also provides some stability. If you thin too large an area one time, sometimes you can have warping take place. This is a cartoon to help make sure you understand what's going on here. The probe tip from this micromanipulator is attached with metal deposition and this is moved down to the grid and attached. Then we cut the probe free, remove it, and then do the final thinning. Now let's show you this whole process, not in real time, maybe Roberto can do it this fast, but I can't. And we're going to show you these steps in this video. Here's the metal deposition. We've cut away on either side. We're now thinning this till it's fairly thin. You can actually see a number of semiconductor layers here. We cut away on all but this little piece. We're bringing in the manipulator needle. We're going to attach the needle with some platinum. Some companies use tungsten. We've cut it away the rest of the way here. We're going to lift this out. 
This is always a happy sight because you know you've broken it completely free. Now in this case we're using a pedestal attachment and we're bringing this sample in and attaching it to this post. We're going to deposit this. Hopefully remember to do that before you cut this away. Now you're going to cut it away. Remove that piece, which is your manipulator with some material attached to it. Now we can use this and do final thinning and put it in the TEM. This process can be done in a matter of uh, a couple of hours. Can't even be done in less time than that. Just to show you an example, you don't have to be too cute about removing that material. As long as you remove it, even though it looks kind of crude here, you're going to thin this further. So some people have developed ways to increase the speed to remove that section. Here's another method of mounting, and I'd like to show you this. Jan Lomas is one of Lucille's students at, when she was at University of Central Florida. <coughs> and in this process, Jan wanted to look at particles. So here's some actual epoxy. She's dipping the needle into it. This is the micromanipulator needle, spreading it on top of the particular grid. And now going over, some of that epoxy is on the tip makes it pretty easy to pick up a particle. I'm going to bring that particle over and deposit it directly on the grid. This way there's no lift out. You're simply placing the particles directly on the grid for final thinning. We have used this successfully at NC State recently, We're looking at particles that people are using for 3D printing. If you work with metals at all, if you prepare a long section, as you thin this, you're removing stress in the material. And as you do that, you are starting to risk that this will warp. And we have seen this occur in a number of examples. What Ben Rossi developed here was to make an expansion joint. So if you have ever seen the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, you can see huge expansion joints. Otherwise, this would move, oh, I think they estimate like 20 feet up and down during the day due to the temperature change. With this expansion joint, now you can thin this and any stress that is in here will be removed. And it seems whenever someone has come up with a problem, here's a blow up of that region, that someone can come up with a way around it. Something to realize is that there is FIB damage on this TM preparation. If you are at 30 keV with your gallium beam and silicon, you're damaging the edge of this oh, on the order of 22 nanometers. And that 22 nanometers is either side. As we get down to something that we want to desire, which might be 30 nanometers, you have something that may be almost totally damaged. The solution to that is instruments that allow you to work at lower energy. Now, by doing the initial cutting at 30 keV, dropping to five and then two, and it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to go much below two keV, you'll see now that most of the section that remains is still the original material and is not damaged. And this is indeed the procedure we use in the final thinning for our TEM samples. The evidence of that can also be seen in this nice pair of images here. <clears throat> These are TEM sections after your preparation with the FIB. Here's your amorphous layer at 30 keV, and here it is at 2 keV. You also see you're getting some very nice definition uh, on this material in terms of being able to show the individual atoms. And indeed, examples uh, 
for silicon and lanthanum hexaboride, showing that we're able to see these in the x-ray images very clearly. So you're not seeing a lot of uh, haze or something like that that prevents you from getting lattice resolution. So far, we've been talking about cross-section TEM orientations. It's also possible to do plan view. It's a little bit trickier because you have to think about how to mount the sample. If you take two pieces of the sample and glue them together and now mount them edgewise, you can obtain a plan view section. Why would you want to do that? Here's just one example. This is a plan view lift out showing an array of over 200 tungsten plugs. If I do this in cross section, I'm going to only get one little slice out of each of these. I can't tell if this is a uniform uh, plug here. I can't tell much about the uniformity of the cladding layer for this plug. At this time, we were able to do an FIB SIMS on this same sample. And here you can see the titanium images showing the value of SIMS in this particular analysis. And this shows the titanium uniformly around the plug. So it means there are no discontinuities. If you now angle that plan view, you can actually look at this array of vias here and see the actual shape as it goes from the bottom to the top of the via. By doing an angle plan view, you get a tremendous amount of information over something which has repeating features. Here's an example of just one. And you'll see that in these depositions and this semiconductor processing, you don't always get this perfect circular feature. You would not be able to determine that with just a single cross section. It's also possible to use a scanning transmission electron microscope, which allows you to leave the sample thicker. This has some other advantages because if you're working in semiconductor industry, or in any particular process, as you're thinning the sample, if you're not quite sure of the orientation, you may remove more of it than you desire, or all of it, if it's a very small feature. If you use a stem, it is possible to look at a sample which is quite a bit thicker. These are images from a one micrometer and a two micrometer thick specimen. You can actually see some idea of this in three dimensions from it. You certainly would be able to tell where to thin or which side to thin, thin further. Now to show you an example of how that was applied to solve a semiconductor problem and to bring in a little bit of the value of TEM plus EDS. Here's a cross section and you'll see that one of these uh, views has what looks like tooth decay. If you now do an EDS image map of that same area, look at the aluminum, titanium, fluorine, silicon, you're particularly seeing the fluorine that is present in here. And what was happening is that in this process, and I'm not sure if it was a mass care, they were getting cleaning solutions, getting down into and destroying the via. If we look at current technology, and I'll refer to one of the papers from NC State 2013 with our Titan TEM. With the four quadrant detectors, you can have atomic resolution, one column of atoms resolution for your EDS analysis. We have one more example here. This is something very recently worked on. And this is preparation for energy dispersive analysis. This is, what, this is designed to solve something where you have to look at something very quickly. And in this case, see the stair step, which is what we used before. We're now going to do a EDS line scan and look at the EDS analysis at various locations as we go deeper in the material. We know the electrons penetrate a certain distance. And that precludes us from doing this with just an EDS analysis directly, because we're going to have problems with the information coming from a layer below. 
we look at the actual result of that, here's the FIV cut, and that took, um, I think, less than five minutes. And then the EDS line scan showing you going through the aluminum layer. Now I'm picking up an SiO2 layer, and now I'm totally into the silicon. The gallium you see here gives you an idea of how much gallium resides in the material after you've done the analysis. We have one more topic to cover, and that is fabrication. And a number of people have used the FIB to look at materials and say, hey, I can make something with that, and I can make it on the micro scale. These are stainless steel structures. This is 1998, and was done at Sandia by Michael Vasile. And you can see that this structure can be machined with quite precision using the FIV. Those tools were actually used to do microsurgery on a rat. Sorry, I heard the rat died, but uh, uh, I don't think they're endangered. But anyway, it, if a surgeon wanted to have a particular tool, in this case, they made one and actually were able to use it to act as a clamp. The features that you're going to see uh, a number of the early ones were made to make micro tools for doing micro machining on various materials. You can also make atomic force microscopy tips in this way. If you use something which is called bit mapping, now let's take an image. So here's the North Carolina State seal, but at 15 micrometer scale bar here, the one we always like to show is this one. And this is a hair actually donated from our head librarian. She donated a hair and we imprinted the NC State Library logo in it. This patterning is used and there are groups at NC State that are using it for micro machining of diamond. And why are they doing that? They're making diamond dyes, which are then used to pattern material. And the spacing, the, the resolution you can obtain is quite dramatic. Not using something we have on our instrument, but financing Matsui. So if you Google his uh, name, you will find many papers. He has been excellent at designing all kinds of features. I like this micro wine glass and uh, it won't even hold one drop of wine, so don't get excited. But it uh, shows you that you're pretty much limited by your imagination. He's gone further, this is 2007, and this is actually a 3D micro nano manipulator with fingers to be able to manipulate. Once again, your imagination is it. I'm sorry we lost Santa Claus, but you can see his sleigh and his reindeer are still present here. You also have the ability to be very creative. So here's a spring-like material. In this case, a piece was cut out and it was lifted onto a pedestal here. Hole was cut out from the middle of it. A crystalline material was picked up and attached to it. And now by going through final polishing and other steps, we made a nice ring here. Uh, I'm not sure who can wear this because that scale bar is five micrometers, but it gives you an idea of the types of things you can do. How many materials can you look at? Just about everything. And I've certainly seen it applied to all of these materials and cross sections, plan views, bulk fibers, powders, we have been cutting off legs on mosquitoes to investigate them. Uh, that's actually kind of fun. But the point is that unless it's something which we've only seen a few materials which are very low temperature melting that are affected by the beam. And we have uh, had great success in looking at just about everything we've wanted to put in the instrument. At this point, I'm going to close so that we have a chance to go for questions and I'll mention again our email addresses for Roberto and I, Roberto's in charge of the FIB instrumentation at NC State. So at this point, uh, Roberto, see if there are any questions that we need to address.
Okay, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please enter them uh, through the chat. Uh, here we got, uh, can you give more explanation on plan view? Plan view, the whole trick is mounting the sample. And the problem is you're normally doing something that's very close to the surface. I'm going to try and go back to the, to the, uh, let's see, is it still on there? Yes, it is. So we can go back. Is that showing? Uh, not yet. All right. So let me go back to um, share screen. Um, is it showing now? Yes. All right. With the cross section, as you're looking at this, it's fairly easy. I have my sample out here and I have room to cut on either side. If I am trying to do a plan view, now the cutting away on this side is a problem because it's so close to the surface. And you'll say, well, maybe that's not an issue. Well, it, it turns it out that it is in terms of working with your sample. And it has usually been beneficial to create a more solid structure to work with. So if I take this piece, cut it in half, and take this one and fold it over on top of it. Sorry, I could probably use another diagram here to show that more clearly. Now I've got something that's quite a bit thicker. In that case, I can work on this and be able to deposit and put the material on. One of the things that's affected if you're trying to work right at the very edge is the deposition. And by having space to do this, you're going to get a more uniform deposition to protect your sample. And therefore, the rest of this procedure is pretty much the same. You're really trying to get the sample in there in an orientation where you can do the plan view. And it's really all the sample preparation. Okay, so I have a question here. Uh, when you were cross-sectioning the Ancantheria, which I hope I said that right, and other non-conductive materials, how were you able to mitigate the charging? To use a flood gun? Do you want to talk on that, Roberto? Yeah, so uh, let's see how, what I usually do is I certainly go to very low voltages when I'm looking at, uh, and what do they have here? Yeah, they're only at 2 kV. So typically I'm at 5 kV or uh, uh, most of the time I'm at 5 kV when I'm imaging stuff. And uh, we do have, uh, if you're using the ion beam and you're getting some um, issue, we do have uh, a way to correct for drift. And essentially it's just putting the electron beam onto an area to prevent that drift. And that's a uh, Thermo Fisher uh, Quanta 3D fib that has that uh, way to mitigate the charging. And that's for the electron part of it. If you're getting charging for the ions, one of the methods we've used successfully is to take some aluminum foil and cut a hole in it, a very small hole, like you would do for uh, maybe your belt buckle. Uh, and putting the aluminum co completely around the sample so that you're exposing this small area leaks the charge away quite successfully in many applications. So you have two charging issues. One is with the ions, one's with the electrons.